I am going to talk very quickly uh, through three projects that span nearly 20 years of work. So um, it's going to be a little bit high level, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards as well. Um, so my engagement with computer games really began uh, while I was in grad school. Um, I was a graduate student in classical studies. I was working on ancient Greek drama and mythology. I was supposed to be doing a lot of reading, a lot of theory work, a lot of going to seminars. So of course, what I was actually doing with my time was playing a lot of games um, and writing games. And I came into the game industry from experience in the 80s playing text adventures where you type to interact um, with, the, with the game world and with the characters in that world. So it was a very text-based, very sort of prose and literature-based kind of game. Um, but I very quickly became interested in building some of these for myself. Um, and I started out uh, with a piece called Galatea. Um, now, if you're familiar with this myth, this is something that I was reading at the time um, for my classes. It's the story of the sculptor Pygmalion who crafts a statue of a woman because, and this is, you know, this is sort of the, the romance but also the horrible anti-feminist angle of this. He decided that all human women were too unfaithful and too horrible and too um, low class for him to interact with, so he's going to make his sculpture of the perfect woman. Um, and then he fell in love with the sculpture and begged the goddess to bring her to life. Um, and in the mythology, that's what's a what actually happened. So I was interested in this story both because it captured to me something really interesting and problematic about the way that women are kind of cast in particular roles, and because it seemed a really interesting thing to try and bring into a game world where I was used to playing games where the characters in the games were there for very utilitarian reasons. You would interact with a character, and the purpose of the character was to give you a quest or to tell you some particular piece of information. You could ask them the same questions over and over and over again, and they would give you the same answers back every time. And I wanted to experiment with what it would be like to make a character for a game who had some kind of interiority, who had feelings about how you treated her, who remembered what you'd said to her before. If you asked her the same question again, she would know Oh, you were repeating yourself. And so the story premise that I came up with for this was that you are a critic and you are visiting this gallery where characters are being exhibited, sort of live statues, which are AI driven. It was a slightly sort of science fiction story at the time. It feels a little bit less science fiction now, actually, but at the time it was a science fiction story. You're visiting these gallery, this gallery and you're talking to this statue that you think is an animate, a, an artificial intelligence character. And as you talk to her, she responds to you, and how you treat her determines um, actually how that story comes out. There are about 70 different ways that the story can end, and in some of them, she has a real kind of human relationship with you, and in some of them, she turns out to actually be a robot. Some of them, she turns out actually to be a kind of a paranormal character. So to kind of show you a little bit of what the gameplay of this actually looks like, you come into this exhibit, and you speak to her, um, and to interact with her, you have to type. Um, so you can examine objects in this world and kind of see what she looks like. She's looking away from you to start with. Um, but you can ask her about objects, about topics, about things that are there. Um, you can ask her about herself. And she actually has a little placard next to her that says you know, who she is and how she was made. And when you ask her about her, the, her creator, Pygmalion, um, she doesn't actually know that, according to that placard, her creator is dead. He committed suicide. Um, so you have this moment where you're actually able to tell her a piece of information about her own backstory that she didn't have. And that kind of affects her emotional state, and she immediately reacts to that. So this is just sort of a small slice of, of the gameplay of that, kind of to give you a sense of, of what it's like. So when I put this out there, it was part of a competition that was being run on Usenet, if anybody remembers what that is, um, and I was expecting about 50 people, maybe max, ever to play it. Um, it wound up being received with a great deal of enthusiasm and um, is now you know, sort of taught on college curricula about electronic literature and this sort of thing. So it has had many, many thousands of players, which was far more than I anticipated at the time. Um, and I got all sorts of really interesting um, 
messages about it from people. Um, I had one person who emailed me and said, I've installed Galatea on my phone. I talk to her every day. She's my best friend now. I was like, that is a very strange reaction to have to this. I'm glad that it worked for you, but whoa. Um, so what was successful about that? Um, as a piece of game design, it was partly about the fact that Interacting with this character was a mix of exploration and progress. You were asking her questions, you were telling her things, you were finding out things about her world. If you asked her enough questions, she would tell you about, um, about her sculptor, about what it felt like to be carved, about his emotional problems that maybe led up to his suicide, all kinds of information about who she was. But you could also progress the story by saying things to her that would cause her to have an emotional reaction, like telling her what really happened to her artist. Um, and so it was really important that there were a number of sort of elements in that interaction that kind of signposted, here are ways that you could get a strong reaction out of this character because people really want those moments of connection. One of the other things that the system was doing was tracking multiple emotional axes. So a lot of games kind of up to this point would track, you've got a spectrum of how much does this person like you and it's just they like you a lot, they like you a little and that's it. Um, this character has sort of an affinity with the player, but there are other axes going on as well. She's tracking, you know, how much do you seem to believe that she's a real person versus believing that she's merely an AI character and she cares about that. She cares about how much um, sort of tension there is between you, which might be kind of sexual tension, it might be emotional tension, and all of those things affect what her reactions are. Um, and the other thing that was very important was just having a huge amount of content and lots of different endings. The, the code size for this was about as large as many other contemporary games of this kind that took eight to 10 to 20 hours to play, but was just all in the form of that actual conversation. So those were all things that were pretty successful about this, and this was back in 2000, so it's been quite a long time ago. Um, things that didn't work so well about it, there was a lot of unintentional challenge in the interaction because it was asking the player to pay attention to what she'd said, what was important about her wording, and come back with questions. And sometimes people didn't guess like what the interesting thing to ask about would be, or sometimes they didn't find a good way of interacting with her, even with the kind of signposts that were there. There was some angle they wanted to pursue that they couldn't, and they got frustrated by that. Um, some areas of the story were more responsive than others. I'd put more energy into some parts than into others, so um, sometimes she didn't have as much to say in certain areas. Um, one of the things that really frustrated some players was, were the limits on the player's expressiveness. You could ask her, tell her about keywords, but you couldn't form full sentences and tell her things that way. She just wasn't gonna understand. And finally, having lots and lots of content was really still not enough. Like even though this was a very large file with a lot of material in it, um, there were lots of things that people wanted to explore and wanted to see from this character that they didn't get out of it. So after building that um, in 2000, as I say, I went on and built a number of other games in this same basic format where you're typing to talk to characters um, and really kind of building out how do we structure conversations that can feel authored, that are expressing some particular um, emotion or experience that I put into it as the creator, but still leave a lot of room for the player to form a relationship there that's meaningful. Uh, so the kind of the second generation of development here was a project called Versu. Um, this was a project that I got into with Richard Evans, who was the lead AI designer on Sims 3. And he had done a lot of work around social practices and the idea of modeling how people interact socially. And he had AI to help characters decide in a particular social interaction, which might be conversation, might be having dinner with somebody, might be dancing with somebody, in that context, what kinds of things are available for you to do. And he created an authoring system that let you um, build conversation, but also build some of those generalizations where the characters would make their own decisions about now I want to be insulting, now I want to be um, emotional towards you, all of those kinds of things. So all of those were elements that helped kind of build out a structure that would flesh out behavior that I hadn't been able to hand author in Galatea. So having the system of Versu kind of supported that. And we worked together, built a number of different stories with this. The biggest story that we built was called Blood and Laurels, which was, um, again, I, I sort of still didn't escape classics. Um, it's a story about um, starting a political insurrection um, in a kind of version of the, the Roman Empire. 
um, where you're making alliances with other characters, deciding whom you're going to poison over dinner, all of this kind of thing. Um, and you can see how this played out. And we'd gotten away from the typing because we didn't want the, the challenge of typing anymore. But there are these options, um, conversation options, ways of interacting with other characters that they would respond to. And you could also see who was in the room. So this was an iPad um, app, and you can kind of see that from the, the way the screenshots looked. But you could see who was in the room and how they were feeling at the moment. And if you tapped on them, you could see kind of what was going on in their mind um, emotionally. Why were they feeling the way were, they were currently feeling? So things about this that worked. Um, the, you could have very dynamic relationships with the characters. So this was a big branching plot, unlike Galatea, which is just in one room. In this story, you were making friendships, you were making political alliances, and the relationships that you built with other characters in that story would determine how the plot went as well. Because if you had characters that thought you were very loyal or thought you were on their side, they might team up with you. So um, that could build out. It was easier to write content at scale because we had those generalizations about social behavior and about the choices that the characters might make. Um, it was possible to see the characters interacting with each other. So one of the cool things about the system was that as a player, you could sit back and not say anything at a dinner party for a while, and the other characters would chat with each other, and you could watch. And they might notice that you were a bit silent, and they might have a reaction to that, but there was this kind of sense of a world that was progressing, that you were present in, but you didn't have to be moving it forward every second by yourself. Um, and then one of my favorite things about this was that you could poison somebody um, in this story. You could get some poison and poison them at a banquet. And this was a really satisfying scene because after you put some poison in their food, there were a couple of beats where they'd keep talking and then they sort of get a bit strangled and then they'd fall over and there would be this huge um, kind of mess where all the servants came and, and tried to figure out what had just happened. And there was something really satisfying about the delayed payoff of the poisoning of sort of seeing them try to keep talking and then fall over, um, which was really a lot of fun. And that was a moment that was completely at the player's discretion when or how or whether to trigger that to happen at all. So it had to be very dynamically generated. Um, things that didn't work so well, there was a lot of complexity in the system that the player couldn't see. Um, there are things that we weren't able to communicate. Individual lines of dialogue didn't really have enough variation to communicate what was going on under the surface. Um, and the stakes of interaction weren't always clear. So sometimes there were characters where if you made them angry, they would betray you later in the story. But if you didn't know that that was what was at stake, those scenes didn't play as powerfully as they might have. Um, and finally, the players really wanted to combine small and large actions. They wanted to be able to throw an olive at somebody, but they also wanted to be able to blackmail somebody. And that was kind of challenging to get the menu to express all of those different things at once. And then the final point really was, um, I was giving a talk uh, at an event that Warren Spector was also at, um, who is a big name in video games, for those of you who are not from that world. And he was talking about what he wanted to see in games, and he was describing wanting to see that kind of emotional and social responsiveness that we had in Versu, and I knew he'd played Versu. And I actually kind of called him out on it, and I said, well, if this is what you want, um, why aren't you happy with what Versu is doing? And he said, it's all text. The problem is it's all text. Um, so to register with people from the AAA game space, at least, we need to be able to build things with different production values and different types of performance. Um, so this brings us to Character Engine, which is what I'm working on now. Um, I'm at Spirit AI. This is a startup started a couple of years ago. I don't have time to kind of tell you the whole backstory on it, but if people are curious, please come up to me after. Um, but we build middleware that is designed to plug into many different engines. So um, classic games, but also VR, AR. You could have a text-only front end for it. You could have other kinds of front ends for it. Um, and it's designed to model how the character is thinking, how they're feeling, and how they're choosing what to say to you on the basis of the narrative that's moving forward, the social practices that they're part of, the emotionality that they're part of. So what I'm going to end on is by sharing with you um, a demonstration that we built for GDC, which is the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. Um, and this is a, a piece where you're starting out, and we, we built this to show as much as possible about what's kind of going on under the surface. Um, you're talking to a character who's on board a space station, um, and she's trying to tell you that you're about to be invaded and what's going to happen to you next. Um, so just to show a little bit of this. Can you hear? No. It's not coming out audio. Well, okay, you can see in any case. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, so what's coming out of the system is the text and all of the markups that says how she should deliver I've the text. I've seen your profile data, citizen. 
So she's a little displeased with you Can right you now. But what you're I seeing on this side um, is the actual diagram of what she's choosing to say, how the text is being generated. She's making choices out of all of those options about what to say to you. Um, and those things can be very dynamic depending on what she knows about you already. Um, so and as I interact with line, her, readers will not usually volunteer who they are. As I'm interacting with her, what the system is doing, I'm typing in input, I could be using speech to text as well. Um, the system is then running a whole series of natural language classifiers on each input. And it's saying, I've detected that this is this type of question, it's this kind of information. I found um, these keywords in that input and they correlate to certain things in the story. And therefore, um, I'm gonna pick my best guess of a good response to that. And then I'm also going to moderate how that text is delivered depending on her emotional state and depending on what the player has already learned and heard. Um, so this gets, this piece goes on for sort of longer than I have uh, time to play because I think I'm out of time now. Um, but I want to show you just one kind of final thing, which is um, we saw just the, the beginning of that video, um, we were polite to her. If we actually start out and uh, say, hey, sexy to her at the beginning. Hey, you, just a moment. You're Gordo, right? Do that again and you're going out the airlock. Right, I am Kara, vice commander here. So what's happened here is that she's actually recognized that what we're doing, you can see up in the, the top readout there, that we've made a sexual approach to her and she doesn't appreciate that. She has her own character traits of being dominant or submissive, being other things, and because she has a dominant character trait, she's actually chosen in that moment to push back on you because of what you said. So we've got those kinds of elements of um, procedural generalization weaving together with what is going on in the narrative in order to produce the particular performance. And every time you play this, it comes out differently. I have um, eight or 10 different videos on this laptop of interacting with this scene, and it's very differently worded every single time, and the dynamics of it flow differently each time. So I'll stop there. I've gone slightly over time. Um, apologies for that, but thank you. <laughs>